Hi friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and it is still winter, and I live in Canada. We are constantly shoveling snow, it is dark all the time, it, it's- the air outside hurts, it actually hurts. It's cold is what I'm getting at, negative 30 degrees with the wind chill last night. Why? I do love Canada and I am happy that we moved back after a few years in the States, but sometimes I really do miss the weather in Virginia. It was nice and warm. With it being the bleakest, coldest, darkest time of the year, I figured that it would be fitting for us to talk about five of my favorite cold tolerant reptiles, so let's go! lot of great pet reptiles out there that don't need a lot of heat and while a couple on my list can certainly make great pets I'm kind of tackling this as my favorite truly cold tolerant reptiles not just okay with room temperature reptiles that you can also keep as pets and I'm omitting avian reptiles too as including birds would kind of be cheating you know blue jays crows Canada geese penguins all of the birds in my backyard like right now well not the penguins but you get the idea, yeah? I'm limiting this to our scaly reptile friends, not our feathered reptile friends. Art, don't, wait, don't birds have scales? Well, yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, all right. Many of the reptiles that I'm talking about today use something called supercooling, where they can actually freeze to some degree and still survive with no ill effects thanks to a little trick up their sleeves, or more accurately, in their veins, I guess, in the form of cryoprotectants in their blood. Basically, antifreeze that prevents the formation of damaging or even fatal ice crystals. Wild, right? And kicking off my list will be the Midland Painted Turtles. If you live up here in the more northerly corners of the world, you might have guessed that there would be a turtle on this list. There are a bunch of turtle species that could easily vie for this spot, but we gotta pick one. And as the first turtle species that I ever caught in the wild, the Midland Painted Turtle gets the nod. I live in southwestern Ontario, and if you're lucky, you can find painted turtles here. But just like every native turtle species in Ontario, they are considered at risk, either endangered or vulnerable, which is really sad. Since I was little, my dad has taken me out fishing just about every single week, and with the exception of a couple of particular spots, only like one in five trips, would I actually see a turtle. Maybe even less than that. I just thought that they were pretty uncommon overall. Well, were my eyes open when I moved to Virginia when I was eight. There was a little pond about 10 minutes from our house that we went fishing at, and on the first hour of our first trip there, at that little pond, I saw more turtles than I had seen in my whole life combined up to that point. Here we have a beautiful female painted turtle. Uh, I caught her just going into the grass, just going into the water over there. They were everywhere and it was awesome. What's a lot less awesome is that now that I'm back in Ontario, I'm actually seeing less now than I was even before I moved, and it's just heartbreaking. Ontario turtles desperately need our help, and there are some great conservation groups doing a lot of hard work to protect our turtles, including the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center. My friend Dion at Reptiliatus did an awesome video in the fall all about the incredible work at OTCC, and I will be putting a link to them and some other turtle groups in the description if you want some more information on how you can help and protect these amazing creatures. I highly encourage you to do so. Anyway, off my soapbox and back to the cool stuff. Now, I don't have a painted turtle to show you, but I do have Agatha here, my red-footed tortoise. She's technically a type of turtle, though she's not cold tolerant, and she is a bit pampered, hence the fancy fancy salad. But she is the closest thing that I've got. Actual painted turtles live all across North America. The Midland Painted Turtles range is from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, west to Lake Superior, and as far south as Tennessee. Those that live up in the more northerly parts of their range need to be able to handle the frozen wasteland that the world turns into each year. But how cold can they really get? Well, they stop eating at 15 degrees Celsius, but they also will remain active at temps far lower. In fact, 
they can survive 100 days under the ice in water that is only about three degrees Celsius with no access to air, you know, because the surface is frozen. Speaking of frozen, they can even freeze for shorter periods of time, going as low as negative nine degrees, then thaw back out and be fine. Even itty bitty little hatchlings have been observed by scientists surviving freezing down to negative 12 degrees in their nests, making them the best of any vertebrate when it comes to their super cooling capacity, which is awesome and not nearly as gross as what allows them to stay locked under the ice for long periods of time, uh, which is that they can breathe through their butt. Yeah. I'm sorry if you didn't want to know that, but it's a thing you know now. I'm actually going to cover that fun fact in more detail, like you need that, and a few other turtle peculiarities in a future video. Here's a sneak peek. Some of them pee out of their mouth. Next on my list of cooler reptiles is the Tuatara. You may have seen my video that I did not too long ago on these guys, but if you haven't or you need a refresher, Tuatara are lizard looking reptiles that are very much not lizards. These critically endangered long lived reptiles are found only in New Zealand and, and they're a little weird, having existed virtually unchanged since before the dinosaurs were snuffed out. They've got no ears, a skeleton so primitive, parts of it are actually still fish-like. No teeth, but you wouldn't know that by looking in their mouth. And, as you can probably guess by the inclusion of them in my list, they are very cold tolerant. While the Tuatara can't super cool and handle temps as low as some of the others on my list, they are happily and actively Tuataraing around at temperatures colder than most reptiles can even survive, as low as five degrees Celsius. As adaptable to the cold as they are, it doesn't really go in the opposite direction. Tuataras overheat and die at temperatures that are at the low end of many tropical reptiles, lower limit of survival. Temps above 28 degrees Celsius are fatal. Not cool, man, because it, it's literally the opposite of warm. on my list is one of my favorite species. It's one that I probably will never own due to their medically significant venom, but I can enjoy these living landmines from afar. The European Outer. These fairly small vipers live across most of Western Europe and into Asia. They get about 60 centimeters long, and I think these guys are stunning. Females generally are more of a brown or reddish coloration, whereas males are more cream, white, or grayish black but it's their incredible zigzag pattern that steals the show. This is my Cali King Snake, Johanna. She is the closest thing I've got with like the high contrast stripe and the colorations, but in the adders, their zigzag is not only super cool looking, it is actually a very special type of camouflage. You see, when deciding what to wear, there are many types of camouflage or coloring to choose from. Many venomous or poisonous animals use an aposematic coloration as a warning. Bright or contrasting colors advertising danger. Coral snakes, wasps, poison dart frogs are all great examples. Others prefer cryptic patterns that blend into the environment to avoid detection, either to evade or hide from predators, or to get close to prey without being detected. European adders with their color and their zigzag breaking up their shape combine these two and layer in a healthy dose of an optical illusion known as flicker fusion when putting together their look. Basically, when they move, this zigzag kind of flashes in a way that just makes it really hard for animals, mammals in particular, to focus on and figure out the speed, direction, or even what it is that they are seeing. This incredible adaptation is getting a dedicated video all of its own very soon. And really, this is about reptiles that can survive the coolest temperatures, not the ones that wear the coolest clothes.
I quit. In the coldest parts of their range, European adders usually hibernate between October and March. Many other species of snakes will brumate or hibernate when the weather shifts finding hibernacula to hunker down in. Hibernacula are basically underground chambers that remain above freezing all winter. Finding a suitable hibernaculum is not always easy to do, but lucky for the European adder, they don't need to be quite as picky as other snakes. They can cool to negative four degrees with no ill effects. Not bad, eh? So what do you think so far? Anything new or surprising that you're learning about for the first time? If so, then you should hit the like button so that other people can learn about new cold tolerant reptiles that they never knew about before. And if none of these animals are new to you, then why not hit that like button to encourage me to try again and make more content about things that you might not actually know about. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to the people who are supporting me and my channel on Patreon. Not only do these folks help me feed my pets, like Tatuba here, help me build the coolest homes for them, and allow me to make super cool videos, these lovely people get to see extended blooper reels, early access to my videos, updates, and all sorts of other goodies. So if you want to support me this way as well, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl to see the different extras that you can get. Thank you. I've talked about my next entry a lot on my channel, and you might have seen this one coming. These shivery serpents have routinely been documented basking on snow in early spring and have even been seen drinking water from melting snowbanks. Garter snakes are North America's most common snake species, with a range extending across the entire continent. They are also North America's most cold tolerant reptile. Some garter species can even freeze up to 40% of their body's water with uh, no ill effects, you know, once they thaw. Now, not all garter species are going to be as cold tolerant as others, but across the board, generally, they are pretty hardy. And most can happily live in a very broad range of temperatures and easily handle big swings in the mercury. One of the most cold tolerant species of garter snake is this guy right here. This lovely little fellow here is Kelly one of my valley garter snakes, which are the only snake species you can actually find in Alaska, so they like it cold. But the red-sided garter snake is the cold weather champ. This subspecies of the common garter snake's range extends from Texas north to the subarctic shores of the Great Slave Lake in Canada's Northwest Territories, where the average annual temperature is just uh, zero degrees Celsius, as cool as that is. They are amazing creatures for way more than just not needing to bundle up. If you want a deep dive into garter snakes, check out my recent video all about them. They are awesome snakes. Last up on my list is not the coolest looking reptile, but when it comes to handling the cold, oh boy, if there is a reptile equivalent of that guy who wears shorts and flip flops in February, this is hey, the one. Hey, hey. Yeah? It's Weird, Dad, okay? Just wear jeans and proper shoes and gloves to get the mail like a normal person. Agreed. No. The viviparous, or common lizard, is a species of itty bitty lizards about two to three inches long and has the largest range of all terrestrial reptiles, being found across huge areas of Europe and into Asia, extending up into the subarctic regions. They look very little like Rosa here, my bearded dragon who is, she's hot tolerant. They are kind of prototypically lizard looking though and have a variety of colors, like a lot of reptiles, from browns, grays, and blacks to kind of greens and reds. They are completely carnivorous and because they are small, that means that what they eat also has to be small. They eat insects, worms, and spiders. Yeah, you guys can, Eat all the spiders you want. Thanks. Come and live in my basement. Plenty of spiders there. Like I said, it would be really easy to look at a viviparous lizard and go, nah, it's a lizard, nothing special. Well, there's more than meets the eye. More than meets the eye. Obviously, they are cold tolerant, hence the list. I'll get to that though. But first, I want to start with their name. Viviparous lizard. Viviparous meaning producing live young. Their biology smart sounding name is Zutoka vivipara. Until 2007, they were thought to be Lacerdas, but they are now classified as Zutoka, which means live birth in Greek. 
vivipara translates to live birth in Latin, so their scientific name literally translates to live birth, live birth, and their common name translates to live birthing lizard. So they give birth to live young, right? Right! And also, wrong. There are certain segments of their population and more southerly parts of their range that have returned to egg-laying ways. This is weird, evolutionarily speaking. Viviparae presumably evolved from oviparae, laying eggs. And these lizards have evolved to produce live young. And evolution usually kind of only goes one way. You don't get back the things that you evolved away from. But it seems like this might be the case with these guys, with a certain portion of them returning back to their egg-laying roots. Egg-laying and live-bearing adults can actually reproduce together, but the young of those pairings tend to not be okay. I haven't dug too much into this yet. It's a topic I'll be covering in more detail along with another cool Australian skink that I just learned about that both lays eggs and gives birth, sometimes even in the same clutch. It Seems like there's a lot going on there. Stay tuned for that. It should be pretty cool. Speaking of cool, that is the point of this video after all. When the weather turns to the fatal temps for most other reptiles, the herbivorous lizard is still active. When it finally gets cold enough for them to tap out, they find an ideal microclimate in the soil and hibernate for up to eight to nine months. As long as their temps stay above negative 10 degrees, that is. If it gets colder than that, what they do is not so much hibernating as it is freezing solid, which they can do for up to two months. Now, if the soil that they bed down in is too moist, they do die. But as long as the soil around them is dry enough, they have little trouble surviving. That's crazy, right? For ectotherms who don't generate their own heat, like reptiles, thermal regulation is a strategy that allows them to do what they do. If they are too warm, they move to a cooler spot and vice versa. They keep themselves in an appropriate external temperature for what they are doing. Sleeping, they go colder. Getting ready to hunt or to digest food, they go to a hot spot. Pretty straightforward. Another strategy some ectotherms employ is something called thermoconformity. That is where an animal just deals with the temperature that they are. Many insects use this. If the temp is okay to do a thing, they do it. If it isn't, they don't. Most cold-blooded creatures primarily use one out of these two strategies, but for these cold-tolerant reptiles that I covered today, they more easily do both. A lot of thermoconforming than normal reptiles in the deepest cold, and the more typical reptile thermoregulation in the spring, summer, and fall months. Being able to leverage these two methods helps them thrive in places where other reptiles just can't even exist. How cool is that? So that's it for today. What do you think about my list? Do you have a favorite cold tolerant reptile that didn't make the cut? There's some super cold tolerant amphibians out there. Should I have pulled a Wiccans and included one of them? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. Another special thanks to my patrons. You guys rock. And until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. While the Tuatara can't soup, <laughs> they, they cannot can soup. <laughs> No, he's clearly, he's clearly YouTube's uh, good boy. He's the filming good boy. Full show. Yeah. yeah. Now, the one and, and only time that Oscar is a good cat. <sighs> I mean, we love him. He's good when he's sleeping. And, and he's outside. Snuggling with you. Yeah, when he's out on his leash outside, he's a good boy then. Yeah. And when he's medicated. Mm-hmm. But other than that, do not recommend. <laughs> okay. Okay. Loved it, would not recommend it. Oscar, we love you. Like. Oh, hey, moving on. <laughs> oh, it said for the like bit, yeah, that's I right. <laughs> I love I you, to, honey. Do I have to move? You see, when deciding what to wear, you can always go with your cat's fur. <laughs> Say, do it properly. No! <laughs>